what you leave behind as a business, an individual or an institution is as important to us as it is to you because we know how difficult it can be to put your future into the hands of another. Whether you are looking to invest your wealth for the first time or consolidate your existing investments, we're here for you. We're committed to making your money work as hard as you do. And the proof is in the relationship we build with each and every client. We know there is no one size fits all. That's why when you speak, we listen. We hear your needs, your wants, and your long-term goals. And from that, we design an investment approach tailored specifically to you by combining flexibility and years of collective investment experience. We're able to start with a full understanding of your investment objectives to create an investment portfolio that is as important to us as it is to you. But why us? From South Africa to Jersey, we help a diverse group of clients grow their wealth by tapping into investment opportunities around the world. If what you want is freedom, our portfolio managers can free up your time by making the decisions that are right for you. If what you want is independence, trade directly on the financial markets through your portfolio manager on your own terms. If what you want is stability, Choose from a range of funds that offer you a choice of fixed income, multi-asset and equity investments. We know that success for you might depend on what you leave behind, while others might want to reap the rewards much sooner. Either way, with our comprehensive range of domestic and offshore investment options, you can trust that we'll get you there. Because if it's personal to you, it's personal to us. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the Melville Douglas 2021 Roundup, our last webinar for the year. My name is Mvombo Nokwina, and I'll be your host this morning. <clears throat> As we near the end of the year, there are a number of investment variables and occurrences throughout the year to reflect on. These include investor concerns about the slowdown in economic growth momentum, growingly hawkish rhetoric from central banks, inflation, as well as South Africa's own headwinds. Now, to help us reflect on these and share Melville Douglas's outlook, we're joined by Bernard Drachi, Melville Douglas's Chief Investment Officer. Before I hand over to Bernard for his presentation, just a few housekeeping rules to guide everyone who's joined us this morning. Firstly, we'd like to encourage everyone to ask questions. Questions can be asked by going to the right-hand side of your screen and clicking on the Q&A box. You'll then be able to ask your questions. And at the end of the presentation, I will assist Bernard in getting through as many of your questions as time will allow. Secondly, please note that all attendees, apart from the presenters, have been muted to prevent any disruptions. Thirdly, a recording of this webinar will be made available for your convenience. Please be patient as we do need to format the recording to make sure it's appropriately formatted before we can send it to you. And lastly, if for any reason you experience a break in transmission or you experience a poor network connection, please close down the app and log in again using the same details. I'll now hand over to Bernard for his opening remarks and presentation. Bernie, good morning and over to you. Good morning, and uh, good morning to everyone, and thanks for thanks for joining us. Right, the uh, presentation should be in front of all. Um, so let me let me kick it off. So I think, as Mvo mentioned, um, what we're going to do today, we're going to talk a little bit about, um, you know, how how investment markets have performed during the last year and the drivers behind it, um, and then we'll also have a look in terms of how we think how we expect things to pan out over the over the next year. I think to start off with, firstly, I think it's very important for people to understand that what we've experienced over the last 12 to 18 months um, has really been unprecedented. So the, um, we've had one of the, the shortest, deepest recessions in history. And I think um, you know, what is also point, important to point out here is how quickly things have recovered. 
um, and, and you know, much quicker than most of us would have expected. And if you look at this chart here, basically the US um, is, is your blue chart uh, or graph there, and the Eurozone, uh, the brown graph. Um, and, and what you will note there is that, um, you know, for both of these regions, the recovery has been very, very quick. Um, and they're basically back to where they were pre-crisis um, and they managed to get there in, in less than two years. So normally if you, go, if you look at, um, you know, how recessions play out and how long it takes for, uh, you know, the global economy to recover, it tends to take anywhere between at least two to three years. Um, this time, this has happened much, much faster than what people expected it to. Um, and as a result of that, we've seen a significant improvement in the employment market, especially in the U.S. So, so you will recall that last year during the crisis, a lot of people, more than 22, lost their jobs. But since then, 17 million uh, of those individuals are back at work, and only 5 million are, are looking for work. Uh, many of them actually don't want to go back to work at this stage. And uh, if you look on the right-hand side, the, the, the encouraging thing is the job vacancies have increased very, very significantly. Um, and so all of a sudden now, a lot of these employee, employers will, have, you know, will basically forced to pay up as they're finding it difficult to get the, um, the required skills. So the job market has improved quite nicely. And with that, of course, wages. Of course, there were other factors driving the, um, you know, the strong growth in the economy. And um, really, a lot of that was a result of the strong and unprecedented um, monetary and fiscal support that we've seen over the period. The year I've just highlighted what has happened in the U.S. again. Um, so, so the copper line there gives you a sense of what has happened with interest rates, um, you know, after the global financial crisis, and then more recently after the uh, the pandemic crisis. Um, and you will see, but just by how much interest rates have been dropped, that we're sitting at very, very low levels at this point in time. But they they haven't just cut interest rates; they've also been uh, the central banks have also been quite busy in terms of buying. Um, government bonds out there. So it's not just government bonds, uh, credit, and, and, and mortgage-backed securities. And they've been doing that to try and provide the necessary liquidity in the markets where things got, got a little bit tough. Um, um, so, you know, and, and they've been supporting interest rates in such a way. So what is interesting, if you look at the Fed's balance sheets, in other words, um, they've, you can see there's been a significant increase there, and much more than what we experienced after the global financial crisis, almost three times more. So the Fed stepped in um, supporting the government while they were basically borrowing money to stimulate the economy and had a, have, you know, played a very important role in trying to keep uh, interest rates under control. As a result of that, um, with all the stimulus in the system and government stepping in with all the income transfer programs to you know, support those that needed it the most in the crisis, uh, debt levels have increased very, very significantly. So here we're looking at uh, the debt levels for both developed economies as well as emerging markets. Um, and what you will see is the government debt levels as a percentage of GDP uh, are basically back to, uh, back to and in the case of emerging markets, higher than what was experienced after World War II. Um, so very significant. Now, I think uh, one needs to bear in mind that this was, this was a requirement, this was needed, um, you know, while we were dealing with a lot of uncertainty and while people were asked to basically go home and, um, and uh, you know, not, not return to work anytime soon. Um, so, so it was very important, but the fact of the matter, you know, that has come with a cost. The good news is that although the debt levels have increased very significantly, one needs to also bear in mind that interest rates are exceptionally low. So governments over the last year, uh, especially in developed economies, have been able to borrow money at very, very low interest rates. Uh, in certain parts of the world, like Europe, for instance, they were able to borrow money at negative rates, uh, where investors were willing to to, to provide funding to the various governments um, in, in return, you know, getting this money back, which, which really doesn't make a lot of sense, but, but that is really what happened over the period. And then one shouldn't underestimate the importance of the global vaccination program that we've seen across many countries. So that's played a very important role in allowing governments to, um, uh, you know, to, to, to ease some of the restrictions that were enforced during the course of last year and earlier this year in places like Europe and the US, et cetera, and even here in South Africa. So, um, so that's allowed people as a result to go back to work um, and for, for economic activity to pick up. In South Africa, unfortunately, um, uh, so if you look at this chart here, South Africa is on the, on, on the very left. Um, what you will see is that although our economy has improved this year and we expect growth this year in the order of 5%, we're still a long way from where we were prior to the crisis. 
Um, so um, if you look at if you look at the horizontal line, that sort of depicts where the level of the various economies were pre-crisis. So let's say towards the end of 2019. Um, and so although we've recovered, we haven't recovered anywhere as, as close as some of our our peers in emerging markets and also some of the developed economies. So if you look on the right hand side, for instance, you will see countries like China and Vietnam. Um, you know their economies are already significantly higher than uh, than what they were pre-crisis. Um, and that is expected to continue to grow into, into next year. Um, and the US is an example as well. You can see they've done a fantastic job in getting that economy back, back on track. And that economy is already at a level higher than what they experienced uh, at the end of 2019. So, um, you know, unfortunately, um, you know, a lot more work required here in South Africa compared to what we're seeing elsewhere. Also, just staying with South Africa, unfortunately, when we look at the formal employment market, this Still another one and a half million people that, that need to find work. Um, so you know there was there's been some rec some improvement, um, you know since uh, since mid last uh, since mid last year, uh, but you will see this year the employment trends have sort of started to to dwindle unfortunately and fade away. So we're sitting with an unemployment rate, a formal unemployment rate in the order of 34 percent. We know the real unemployment rate is probably closer to 50 percent. Um, so really sitting with a crisis and a lot of work. Um, uh, ahead of us. The positive news is, I guess, this year, and one of the key drivers for uh, for global markets, um, and specifically talking about equities, credit, um, in general, is is what you will see is basically how quickly um, earnings growth or profits have recovered, both globally as well as here in South Africa. So um, the sort of dark blue line uh, is basically here we look at the earnings growth for for or basically, you know, global globally global stocks uh, as a whole. Uh, the gray line is, you know, what has happened here in South Africa. And um, and what you will notice here is um, what is very interesting this year alone. Uh, earnings for um, for global companies um, have increased by 50%. Now, what that means in effect is, remember last year, um, you know, if you look at it on a year-on-year -year basis, at one stage. Uh, earnings declined by 25%. So once we get to the end of this year, the level of earnings or profits for the average company out there is 15% higher than where it was, uh, you know, prior to the crisis. Um, in South Africa, what is interesting, um, so the, the, you know, if you want to know what what we've done this year, look at the left axis. Um, so you know, and the JSE, um, or at least the companies listed on the JSE, have been able to grow their profits, or basically double their profits over the last year. So so profits have increased by 100%. And so it's amazing to think, even though this economy is, is finding life quite difficult, at least for the companies listed on the JSE, their earnings will be 50% higher than what they were prior to the crisis. So that's quite amazing. And look, a lot of this has been driven by, you know, you know, much higher commodity prices, <clears throat> and so the mining industry and, and other cyclical um, sectors have benefited from that. Um, but quite amazing to think a year or a year and a half later, companies have been able to recover as quickly as they, as, as they have. Now, what is quite typical in any um, recovery cycle is basically that cyclical sectors or stocks tend to outperform. So if you look at the returns over the last 12 months, uh, and this, this is basically looking at sectors at a global scale, what you will see is sectors such as energy up 85%, financials up 60%, IT has continued to do well as more people use technology and companies, et cetera, so that's up 45%. But the underperformance has really come from the, the more um, um, you know, stable type of companies, more defensive counters. So although the likes of discretion in telcos and staples and utilities gave you quite a nice positive return over the period, um, certainly as far as their share prices are concerned, uh, which has really been a function of, you know, the recovery in earnings, uh, you can see they've underperformed the cyclicals. So, so it's very typical of, one would, uh, one, of what one would expect uh, when you go into, uh, you know, uh, into a recovery phase. Um, the only thing I will say is the extent of the performance that we've seen over the last year has, has, been, has been extraordinary. For South African investors, uh, also interesting if we look at the last 12 months, the JSC has continued to outperform uh, you know, the global market. So the gray line is basically the JSE, the all share index, and the copper line or brown line there is, is the uh, you know, international markets uh, um, in, converted back into rands. And then we show bonds in blue and, and then cash right at the bottom. So for investors with, with multi-asset portfolios or even just with equity portfolios, they've done exceptionally well over the last 
Um, I think it is worth highlighting, however, that since um, April, May this year, uh, you will see there was quite a significant gap between the performance of our own market and that of, of international market. But since then, uh, that gap has narrowed quite significantly. So we've started to underperform. Again, this is not unexpected and a function of, um, you know, uh, the global economy starting to slow down. So trends starting to normalize. We tend to do quite well in South Africa, uh, especially the mining companies, in the early phase of recovery. But on a year-to-date basis, in actual fact, performance between um, you know, our own stock market versus the, the international markets is, is currently very similar. So one of the effects from the pandemic has been um, you know, what has happened with inflation. So, so this is simply looking at the inflation rate for a number of developed economies. I've also included China here. Um, and um, look, I'm sure for those of you that are, that are reading uh, the financial press, you would have picked up the level of inflation have picked up very significantly. Also, for those of you owning companies, you would have seen uh, your costs increasing very significantly. Um, so in the US, for instance, when we look at headline inflation, so this is not core inflation, but certainly you know, overall inflation, that's sitting at north of 6%, and that is expected still to, to increase in the near term. Uh, and even in places like, uh, like Germany, for instance, in Europe, uh, you know, they're sitting with inflation in the order of 4.5%. 4 so much, much higher than what we've previously expected. Now, there are a couple of reasons for this. The one is, um, obviously, um, if we go back to what happened in 2020, prices uh, were under pressure. And in actual fact, in some countries, some countries experienced deflation. Um, and, for, and for other countries, you know, the inflation levels got close to zero. You've got base effects, I guess, uh, working against you um, when we calculate, uh, you know, inflation, which is basically uh, the price increase year on year. But it's not just that. It's also um, because people have been asked to either go home or, or, or companies have been, been asked to close down for a period of time, um, you know, manufacturing hasn't picked up as, as much as expected. So basically, we've had a lot of stimulus in the system coming from, you know, both governments as well as central banks. A lot of money has been pumped into the system. So liquidity has picked up. Demand has improved very significantly. And there's still a lot of pent-up demand in the system. But you, you, we're sitting in an environment currently where demand is still very strong, but unfortunately, there's just not enough goods uh, on offer at this point in time. Now, so this makes this, this recovery very, very different to previous cycles. Um, so, so previously, you know, one would see demand picking up, prices improve as well, uh, but, but when that happens, supply uh, reacting to it this time around, supply hasn't been able to, to, to meet demand. So we've got a situation currently where, where, the, where, the, where demand is still stronger than supply, and, and, and that's to a large extent causing the significant pickup in inflation. So we don't think inflation will inflation will, will remain at these sort of levels. We think by the end of next year, uh, the inflation levels will uh, are expected to decline quite significantly, but perhaps not to the levels that was experienced prior to the crisis. The good news is, um, you know, as far as these supply bottlenecks are concerned, there are some signs that that it's uh, that it's starting to ease, and we'll talk about that a bit later. Now that's history. So let's look at, at the future. Um, so here what I have is basically the forecast from, from my IMF, the latest forecast on how they see you know, economic activity panning out over the next year. Um, <clears throat> so if you look at this year, for instance, the global economy is expected to grow in the order of 6% versus, uh, versus last year's decline of, of 3%. So obviously base effects working in your favor here. And if you look at next year, the, you know, what is perhaps more important is uh, that growth rate is expected to be in the order of 5%. Um, and uh, if you look at South Africa, right at the bottom, um, a little bit unfortunate, you know, our growth is expected to slow down from 5% this year, and that 5% could be still slightly higher. Uh, we, 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 we're actually looking for growth in the order of 5.2%, but be this in May, 5% is a good enough indication of growth this year, but then next year to slow down to around 2%. So I think when we look at the global fundamentals, they, they still remain quite supportive. The one thing that I will highlight is I think that um, as far as the risks are concerned, they're all pointing to the downside here. And some of those risks include obviously the supply bottlenecks that the world is currently dealing with. Um, and it appears to be persisting for much longer than what, what, we, what we previously expected or were hoping for. Inflation is high um, and, 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 and sticky. And then of course, we still have COVID, uh, which, which clearly um, you know, poses a, a downside risk. So the, fun, the numbers are looking absolutely fine but we would expect in actual fact numbers to decline. Even on, on even though if those numbers come down, let's say from five to 4%, that is still a very, very good outcome 
for the global economy. So we expect, um, in other words, growth next year to be uh, above trend. Uh, and by the end of next year, beginning of 2023, for the global economy to sort of go back to the trend line growth that we experienced um, after the global financial crisis. So one of the risks that I spoke about is obviously COVID, um, and and as, as you're all aware, we're now get, we're now entering the fourth wave again. Uh, in Europe, the numbers aren't looking great. Uh, you know, we've all seen the numbers out of you know what's happening in Austria, Germany, etc., uh, where they're basically enforcing restrictions again. Um, and who knows? In South Africa, I'm sure the, the same the same will, will play out as well. Now the problem with with this is that um, you know although we're all being vaccinated, etc. Um, you know, when, when, when these waves come through, for instance, um, it definitely has an impact in terms of, um, you know, the consumer's willingness to go out and spend, and it also changes their the behavior. Um, so, unfortunately, um, you know, every single time this happens, um, there will be a knock-on effect on the economy. The good news is that the, the knock-on effect every single time is also, also less than what it was previously. Uh, and a lot of that is a function of you know, companies have been able to adapt to the new environment, more people have been vaccinated, um, so all of that helps. Um, but, but the fact of the matter is it does actually hold back the economy for a period of time. Then also when we look at growth momentum, so this is just something we at, we'll look at uh, guys, it's a US ISM PMI new orders, you can see that that has started to trend lower. It's, so it's still, it's still anything above 50 is still positive. Um, so that's the, the dark blue line there. So you know, it's still you know, things are still expanding, um, but clearly, um, you know, growing at a slightly lower rate. Um, and when that happens, also what one can expect from uh, the equity market, in this case, I've just selected the S and P, um, uh, is is basically you know, as the economy slows down, expect lower returns um, going forward. Also, I, could, I guess an important leading indicator of, of what's what's going on globally in terms of demand. Is, is, is commodities and specifically you know, here I'm looking at, at some of the industrial metals. Uh, I've included gold as well. Uh, but the point being is that since April, May this year, you will find for most of these commodities that actually started to trend lower. And in the case of iron ore, much lower. Um, and you can see by how much that, you know, those prices have collapsed. Now, a lot of this is currently driven by, um, you know, the slowdown that, is, that the, the Chinese economy has experienced. They're obviously dealing with the with, with, with economy that was Probably a little bit overheated, um, uh, you know, when they when they got to the beginning of this year, um, uh, and they've been trying to deflate the property market um, and, and slow down the credit demand. But as a result of that, that economy has been slowing down, um, and so therefore the demand for uh, you know for commodities also have been have been affected. Um, we spoke about the supply bottlenecks, and and what this highlights basically is uh, we, here we're looking at the backlogs um, versus delivery times, and, and and you can see there's a strong correlation here. So, um, you know, as a result of the increase in backlogs, in other words, you know, demand outpacing supply at this at this at this stage, the delivery times have also increased quite significantly. As I said more recently, we're seeing signs of, signs of uh, improvement there, but certainly when you know when you're experiencing this that also results in slower growth. In other words, you know, the economy is being held back simply by the fact that uh, not enough is, 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 is able to, to be produced at this, at this point in time. Then just uh, I spoke about uh, the fact that we're seeing some improvement uh, as far as the supply bottlenecks are concerned. So it's still early days, but, but there has been some improvement. So when I mean, you all would have read about what's happening in the semiconductor space, so things there has improved quite a bit. So manufacturing activity has improved and has resulted in um, uh, the auto industry, in actual fact, uh, starting to, uh, to, you know, produce more vehicles. Um, so that, that obviously is one industry that's very reliant on on, on the input from semiconductors, although it's only one of one of the inputs uh, to when man manufacturing a vehicle. Um, but but something else to look at also is is basically looking at sea freight rates. So here specifically, I'm looking at the Baltic Dry Index, um, and and what you will see if you look at the price uh, price of, of freight um, uh, earlier this year, you can see that increased very significantly, almost fivefold uh, over a short period of time. Um, but since then, you can see the prices have started to come down very significantly. So, so this particular index has basically halved over the over the last few months, and has, has continued to move to move lower. On the right hand side, we've just given you sort of a breakdown of of what has driven this the significant pickup in in uh, you know uh, freight prices. 
And what you will see there in both the first quarter and second quarter of this year was really just a, a, a shortage in supply. So basically, um, and that's that's currently being being dealt with. So uh, and as a result of that, we've seen prices normalize. Um, the same goes, you know, one can look at many other commodities, including uh, uh, um, wood prices in the US, where earlier this year that increased very significantly. Um, but since then, you know, it's returned back to the levels that was experienced, uh, you know, uh, prior to the crisis. There's certainly some improvement as far as the supply bottlenecks are concerned. But as I said, it's still very early days. And then, of course, um, you know, the oil price has increased very significantly those last year. Got to below $10 a barrel. Can you, can you believe it? We're now sitting in the order of $80 a barrel. And when that happens, obviously, there's a very strong correlation between, you know, the price of, in, of oil, uh, fuel, and that of inflation. Um, so, obviously, when the price of fuel goes up, the cost of transport goes up, the cost of food goes up, and so it goes. So our view on this is that we think that the, the oil price may very well remain at these levels for a little bit longer, uh, but we still expect if one takes a slightly longer term view, that the, that the price of oil will, will return to slightly lower levels, possibly you know, in, the, in, the li in the high 60s, lower 70s. Um, but, but perhaps we'll only see that towards the latter part of last year, uh, next year. Um, so we think it will, it will decline on the back of slower growth, and also, we know that there has been supply disruptions, you know, uh, in, in that, on that side as well. So um, another important thing to make here is that remember, um, when, one, when, one, when one calculates inflation, it is the price increase year on year. So if the oil price just remains at these levels uh, without increasing significantly, that alone will result in inflation, you know, trending lower during the course of, of, of next year. Uh, and perhaps we'll start seeing deflation in certain product items um, in 2023. But the issue about the, the current increase in inflation is it's obviously eating wallets and into the disposable income. And when that happens, that, office, that has an impact on the consumer's uh, confidence levels uh, or sentiment. Um, so we, yeah, we've, we've just, we're just looking at consumer confidence in the US. That's a dark blue line. Um, and, and you can see that started to trend lower a little bit as a result of um, you know, high inflation. Um, it's, it also really hasn't helped for, for, for President Biden um, uh, because people are obviously concerned. When people start to become concerned about their own income, uh, you know, they'll, they'll definitely uh, uh, you know, make the politicians know, know about that. And then, of course, as far as retail sales are concerned in the U.S., you can see the numbers, they are still very strong. They're still growing, uh, you know, at, at high single digits. Uh, but certainly the growth momentum there has also started to fade a little bit on the back of you know, base effects as well as as well as the impact of high inflation on on real disposable income. So, as far as inflation is concerned, I guess the good news at this point, inflation expectations um, over the next over the next five years for both uh, US and Europe. Um, and what you can see, although inflation expectations have been have been increasing uh, over the over the last over the last few months. Um, it, it's, it's, it, we're still not at very, very high levels. So in the US, you know, the market's now expecting inflation to average in the order of 2.5%, and in Europe, um, you know, around 1.7%. Now, the one thing I will say is, um, if you see something to go by, these inflation expectations tend to be higher than when uh, where inflation actually uh, prints it uh, over the longer term. Uh, but, but, but even so, um, you know, this, this, this won't be necessarily a cause of concern for central banks. But they would be concerned uh, if this were to change, for instance, on a sustained basis. But at this point in time, inflation expectations have moved higher, um, but certainly not, not out of control at this stage. So I guess the issue about high inflation is, you know, the big risk um, that a lot of people are talking about is, is, is what does this mean in terms of economic growth going forward? And a lot of you probably would have heard the, the phrase stagflation. In other words, that's where the economy slows down quite a bit and you're sitting with high inflation. So, so what, does, what do central banks do in that sort of environment? So what we've seen, obviously, as a result of the much higher inflation and numbers, which have surprised this year, it surprised everyone, to be perfectly honest, is that central banks have become a little bit more hawkish. So in emerging economies, we've seen interest rates, uh, you know, uh, moving higher. And we even saw that in South Africa last week when an you know, unreserved bank high rates for the first time. It came as a little bit of a surprise, um, but be that as it may, uh, you know, we can see the trend has, has changed there. 
Um, and so the risk, of course, is that that you know developed market central banks um, such as the US, UK, and um, and in Europe, uh, that the central banks start hiking there, and perhaps too you know too much over a short period of time, which could result in a significant slowdown in the economy. And now at this point in time, we don't think that is what is going to play out. We still think inflation will trend lower. Um, but clearly, the, the pressure there's a lot more pressure as, uh, for these central banks. I mean, you know, if inflation remains here for much longer, let's say for the next six months, they will have to they will have to act. Because at the end of the day, what you don't want is for inflation expectations to get sort of uh, you know out of control, as I, as I mentioned earlier. So, so clearly, um, you know, monetary stimulus or the monetary environment uh, is changing gears. It's still there's still a lot of support in the system, but I think the point to make is there will be less support going forward, and that's very normal of any economic cycle. So the economy is sort of get to a stage where, you know, where, where they grow the growing reasonably well, inflation starts to pick up, maybe not as high as, 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 as what we're currently experiencing. And then central banks start the process of normalizing, normalizing interest rates. So I think the important thing here is that interest rates from these levels will move higher, but bear in mind, we're coming off very, very depressed levels. So they're still very, very low. So even if they were to move higher, it is unlikely that will have a significant impact on, on the global economy. So just um, you know, continuing on on the you know you know our views on the monetary environment. Um, so this just indicates basically that the um, the quarterly purchases. So this is the purchases of uh, of bonds, basically government bonds, credit, um, etc., um, by central banks, um, has slowed down quite a bit this year, and that is expected to continue to slow down. So so when that happens, in other words, you take you know you take out one of the one of the largest buyers uh, in the market, and so therefore one would expect you know, bond yields also to start moving higher, especially in developed markets, not necessarily in South Africa. Um, but the point being is that some of the stimulus will be, will be taken away over a period of time. So when we look at the interest rate forecast, basically for those two countries, you know, what the market currently is expecting is, is, is rates to pick up quite, quite a bit. In the US, if you look at over the next 12 months, from these levels, the expectation now is that the interest rates will increase by 50 basis points. So we're looking at two hikes of 25 basis point each. Um, uh, and look, that is expected to materialize, I guess, um, you know, once the, the, the tapering event comes to an end in June, July next year in the US. And in South Africa also, the expectation is that over the next year, interest rates are, uh, are expected at this stage to, to, to be increased by at least 100 basis points, if not 125 basis points. But clearly, the outlook for interest rates have changed quite a bit in the course of this year. And if you compare the dark blue line, that's the latest uh, expectations by the by the market compared to the copper line, um, which is basically what was expected only a few months ago. And just coming back to the fiscal stimulus. Um, so as I've said before, um, you know, governments have played a very important role in uh, assisting the economies during during, during the pand pandemic and the slowdown. And, and in 2020, I mean, that, you know, the extent of that was raising a significant. So close to 5% of the global economy um, uh, uh, or, the, or the size of the fiscal stimulus uh, equated to around about 5% of the global economy. So that's very, very significant. And as I said, much more than what we experienced previously. And now going forward, there will still be stimulus. And I think it's important to make the point that the amount of fiscal stimulus is, will be much higher than what we experienced um, after the global financial crisis. But the point being is that um, you know the, the fiscal stimulus have now reached a negative impulse. So although although money will still be spent, much less money will go into the economies. And so as, as a result of that, that, that will cause a headwind, will be a headwind, um, you know, for the global economy. Um, this year uh, it's expected to be around one percent, and next year in the order of two percent. So um, one shouldn't be overly concerned about this because a lot of this will be offset by you know the pickup in employment that we're currently seeing. We're still sitting with excess savings uh, and pent-up demand as far as consumers are concerned. And of course, you know, we still expect a significant pickup in an inventory uh, rebuild um, as, as, as manufacturing starts, starts to normalize. Then I think importantly, um, we need to look at also valuations about the macro and the growth environment. But you know, valuations also play an important role in terms of what one can expect in terms of growth going forward. Now, the good news here for investors is that this year equity markets have, have produced very good results uh, for, for most investors. Um, um, but what is interesting in actual fact is that the earnings growth, as, I, earnings growth, as I've indicated earlier, 
um, have been much, much stronger than the increase in prices. In other words, we've seen earnings or the level of earnings starting to catch up with, with prices. So therefore, um, you know, equity markets have started to derate this year, which is not a bad thing. So in other words, if we now look at, um, you know, the valuation of equity markets, um, and I've selected a, a few developed markets here, what you will see is that in most cases, uh, if you look at where the current ratings are, which is basically the, depicted by, 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 the, by the blue diamond there, what you will see that is below the sort of long-term averages. Um, so the only, only market really that are still looking uh, quite expensive, um, or at least pricey at this point in time, is the US. But one also needs to bear in mind that compared to history, uh, the composition of that index is very different. So, so IT is a much bigger component of that index than what it, what it was like 10 to 15 years ago. Um, and of course, those are the companies that are producing you know, the very strong growth in, in profits. So equity valuations have improved. They're not cheap, uh, but certainly you know, not as expensive from a valuation point of view as they, as, been, uh, as they were only a few months ago. And also, when one looks at equity valuations, one needs to compare that to what else is available. So one of, one of the most important other asset classes for investors to concerned, um, and especially multi-asset portfolios, would be um, you know, fixed income, so bonds. So here we, we basically just compare the earnings yield uh, of equities to, to that of bonds. And what you will see here is that um, if you look at where that's currently trading, that's very much in line with, with long-term needs. So certainly, relative to bonds, um, very difficult to argue that equities are, are very expensive at this stage. Now, of course, the view is that, that bonds uh, or, the, or the yield of bonds should, from these levels and in developed markets, start to pick up a little bit. Um, but even so, um, you know, equities don't look excessively priced. But if you look at the expected returns going forward, and this is taking a long term effect over the next year, so just bear that in mind. And I've selected the, the US, the S&P, which is a little bit pricey at this point in time, as I've, as I've indicated. Um, clearly, what you, what you can see over the long term, that obviously the more you pay for an asset, the lower the expected return um, you know, uh, from those levels. Again, you'll be looking at the subsequent 10-year returns from a specific level, so it's not what we expect next year. But be that as it may, um, from these levels, one should expect lower returns from, from, uh, you know, from markets, and specifically the US. Here we're looking at returns in the order of five to eight percent over the over the next ten years, which is not a, which is not still not still not a bad environment for equities, but certainly not what we've experienced over the last over the last five and ten years. Over the last five years, we've seen the global global market uh, you know compounding at rates of more than fifteen percent, and over the last ten years uh, at a rate of more than eleven percent. So we just don't think that is necessarily going to to happen over the. Uh, over the foreseeable future, except of course, if there's a significant correction in, in equity markets, um, which obviously um, you know will assist from a valuation point of view. So I spoke about inflation earlier, and, and the, the, one of the main reasons for that is um, you know there is a inflation that of that of stock markets uh, valuations. In other words, when you get into an environment where inflation becomes very high. <clears throat> what one tends to find is, is the PE multiples tend to derate, but the opposite is also true. So when inflation trends lower, um, you know, the PE multiples also benefit from that. So we think uh, a lot of that is already in the price, but clearly if inflation remains at these levels uh, on a sustained basis, which is not our, our base, baseline view, uh, you know, it is possible that, that equity markets per se can actually derate to sort of below average uh, levels. The other thing also, other point to make about inflation, apart from the fact that it's eating into, you know, the disposable income, it's also clearly having an impact on, on the cost for companies. And for certain companies, especially those that don't have pricing power, they will start feeling, feeling some margin pressures. And we've already seen that starting to play out. Now, in South Africa, inflation is less of a concern. So, so these are the latest inflation numbers, both, you know, at a CPI level as well as a PPI level. Um, and you can see the CPI is still very much, uh, you know, trading within uh, its, its, its range um, of 3 to 6%. Uh, and we don't expect that necessarily to, to, you know, to move up much higher from these levels. Um, so we think in a year's time, inflation will probably still be in, you know, at these sort of levels. So that's in line with consensus and what the Reserve Bank is telling us. So inflation is not a problem. It certainly has picked up. And, and there are risks, of course, here. We're one of the reasons why, it's, why I'm in the central bank here. You know, has, has decided to, to start normalizing interest rates from very, very low levels. So although inflation is not a concern, our biggest problem in this country, unfortunately, is growth. Um, and, and, and here's a, um, 
I guess, interesting way of looking at this. So this is looking at the real GDP per capita. So it's a per individual, basically. And the trend here is exceptionally negative. So you will see that since uh, 20, 20, 2013, 2014, um, the real GDP per capita um, has been declining every year. And of course, last year, uh, you know, we had a significant uh, recession, uh, which resulted in uh, real GDP per capita declining by 8%. So these are one of the challenges that we need to overcome in order to, to, to move forward and deal with our unemployment issue. But you can see, even see prior to that, um, you know, 2011, 12, and 13, that although we had positive real GDP per capita, so those numbers were, you know, we were still very, very low compared to our peers and, and, and many other um, developed, uh, developed economies. Having said that, um, you know, our, our markets or our assets in South Africa are not expensive. So the dark blue line there is basically the price to earnings ratio of the uh, of one of the one of the um, indices that we look at, and specifically the one we're looking at here is is what, what is referred to as the CAP SWIX index. Um, and if you look at that, um, you can see the, the valuation over the last few years have been trending lower, and they've been trending lower because growth has been so lackluster. Um, and of course, we've just dealt with you know with with, with pandemic and its effects on our economy. So the market has already discounted a lot of a lot of bad news uh, at these levels. Uh, although we've seen a recovery of late, um, and if you look at our bond market here as an example, you know ten-year uh, bonds trading at around ten percent, we think that's 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 quite attractive. And when one looks at the um, the fixed income market or the bond market um, in South Africa, and one compares that with what else is available there in the world, you will see that our bonds are very attractive. So in real terms, in other words, when you want to adjust for the level of inflation, bonds in South Africa are, are yielding uh, investors 5%. That is very, very attractive. Um, and if you compare that to say what is happening in developed economies, given, given where current inflation rates are, uh, bond, bond yields there um, are providing investors with negative real returns. In other words, um, you know, even if inflation starts to moderate in, in places like the US, UK, and Germany, it is probably very, very unlikely that those investors will be able to beat inflation over the next over the next ten years. So our bonds, relative relative to what else is available there, um, are looking very attractive. Um, so we we continue to, to to remain constructive on equity. So we know that we're going into an environment where growth is slowing down. Uh, that doesn't mean that, that necessarily that equity to returns should be negative. It just means that returns are going to be lower. Um, and and, and what, what we illustrate here is basically, you know, equity markets tend to find life quite difficult only in periods of recession. In other words, in periods where earnings growth starts going negative or the economy, uh, you know, pr produce a negative, a negative uh, growth rate. Uh, we don't expect that at least in the next year or so. And as a result of that, uh, you know, we've, we've we continue to remain overweight equities at this stage. Um, the, the other point to make is, you know, we look at a, a number of what we call tried and tested recession indicators. Uh, and what you will see there is that, is that none of those indicators at this point in time pointing to, to any, 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 necess, any concern at this point in time. So nothing's, nothing's blue, uh, is blue or amber, sorry, is red or amber at this point in time and also showing in indicating green so when we look at this for instance um, you know at the various indicators you know we remain quite constructive on the outlook for growth uh, per se and and, um, and of course equity markets having said that just bear in mind that, that we certainly expect returns to be low going forward and i think another important driver for, for for investors from equities over the next few years will be you know basically dividends so the dividend payout ratio over the last year has obviously declined very significantly, and that was that's quite normal. This is what happens during a, during a recession, and of course there were a lot of uncertainties that played out during the recession, and we're still dealing with COVID. So companies have been focusing on their balance sheets uh, over over the past year or so, trying to protect their balance sheets. Uh, and one of, one of the ways of doing that um, is by cutting dividends. Um, but what we're now starting to see, or expect at least over the next few years, is for the dividend payout ratio to start improve. So it is quite possible over the next two to three years that for many companies, uh, you know, dividends will grow in the order of between 50 and 80%. Um, so we think that will be, you know, quite a nice underpin for, for investors. So although the, the sort of price appreciation is expected to slow down a little bit, um, you know, don't forget about the importance of, of dividends um, as, a, as a contributor to, to, to investors' overall returns. Um, 
All right, I think just to conclude, um, the um, the outlook for the global global economy has uh, has um, has become so slightly less supportive. So we expect growth to slow down a little bit, although we still expect it to be above trend. Um, central banks have become more hawkish, um, and so we would expect, uh, you know, at some point in time next next year, for developed economies or de developed market economies or central banks to start hiking interest rates. We expect uh, the Bank of England, for instance, to to you know to enforce their first hike. Um, the next meeting uh, next month. Um, fiscal stimulus is still is still um, is still going to remain in force for a period of time, but it's going to be less than what we experienced, uh, you know, obviously during the last year. Some of the debt will have to be repaid at some point in time, and some of these fiscal initiatives need to be funded. Some, uh, you know, it's quite possible that we uh, that, that especially in countries like the US, um, that it, that the tax rates uh, move higher from these levels. Now, in terms of what we're seeing and 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 the debates out there, uh, we don't expect that to to make an impact on growth or earnings for companies. And and look, the 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 market will sort of also look through it as a once-off event. So inflation remains a headwind, um, and, and so as I've indicated, we expect inflation to lower. But if we're wrong on that side, you know, it's possible that that, that interest rates uh, you know move move up more aggressively. And that could be quite negative for valuations and and potentially growth as well in future. But that's that's not what we currently expect. Um, and and the supply bottlenecks have obviously um, you know slowed down the economy and result in high inflation. We expect that that to ease um, you know as as things start start to normalise. As far as global assets are concerned, especially outside of South Africa, I mean they're not cheap. Um, they're not looking overly overly priced except for. Uh, you know, we think developed market bonds are still very expensive, um, but certainly from these sort of valuations, you know, investors should expect uh, slightly lower returns going forward over the long term. Um, in, in SA, I've spoken about that. You know, SA, SA assets are offering good value. In South Africa, you know, what is very important is the rollout of, um, and the, you know, of, of the, the growth initiatives from government um, that needs to be implemented and, uh, and um, uh, uh, enforced. Um, so the restructuring at ESA is need to take place. I mean, all of this, unfortunately, just taken much longer than we we're hoping for. Um, but without that, um, it's going to be very difficult to, uh, you know, for confidence to improve uh, um, and for the employment situation to 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 improve. But, but be that it may, there are there are these growth initiatives in place, and we would expect that to support our economy, uh, you know, over the next over the next few. Years. But as um, the global economy slows down, um, you know, obviously. That will also impact our own economy in South Africa. And as I've indicated, next year we're expecting growth in the order of 2%, and the year thereafter, maybe slightly less than that. So, so we're moving in a month where growth is, is sort of moderating a little bit. And as a result of that, uh, we think it's important for investors to be more vigilant um, and, 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 and selective in their, in their, in their approach. Um, and so, so therefore, uh, you know, um, we think it's important for investors to focus on companies with strong balance sheets. Um, unique, you, you know, uh, companies with unique offerings that gives them pricing power, uh, and those companies we think will continue to outperform in this sort of environment. And then finally, as always, uh, very important to to make sure that your one's portfolio is is diversified, uh, focus on the fundamentals as opposed to all the all the news or the media out there. Uh, BPV patient. I mean, I think that's also very important for investors, especially long term investors, uh, and 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 always try to never overpay. Well, thank you very much. And with that, I'm going to hand over to to Humbo for any questions. Thank you for that. Um, it was a very good uh, reflection uh, and a nice roundup of the year 2021. Um, just first of all, just as a reminder to all the audience, a recording of this uh, session will be made available once it's formatted and will be sent to you via email. Um, we haven't seen too many questions come through, Bernd, but I do have some of my own. But I'll start with some questions in the Q&A box, and then I'll move to some of my questions. Um, and again, to the audience, if there are any questions you still have, please feel free to post those on the Q&A box on the right-hand side. So the first question from Paul Gregory is, what is the outlook on property locally and globally? I think the, the outlook for property, um, especially in South Africa, is still quite tough. Um, part of it is a function of, of the oversupply, especially in the office space and maybe to a lesser extent in the retail as well. Uh, but certainly, um, you know, I, we, just, we just think that there's, there's still an oversupply. 
you know, our economy really isn't back to the levels it, it used to be. Uh, pricing power has, has, I guess, shifted from, from landlords to tenants. And so, uh, you know, we still think in South Africa, for instance, the risk is to, to the downside for, for distributions going forward. So some of these property counters, um, you know, there's some of those stocks have improved quite nicely from, from their lows, uh, but in hindsight, perhaps oversold levels. But certainly we don't think the, the fundamentals uh, for, for property in South Africa per se um, is, is that positive. Um, one can make an argument that in the industrial space, um, you know, um, as, as more and more uh, you know, people are buying goods, you know, goods from home and online, um, that, 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 that those, uh, you know, companies that are basically in warehousing and logistics, um, I guess, will, will benefit more, more than the others. Um, and that their growth rates, uh, you know, probably, probably will be relatively sound in the next few years. I think it's the same, the same in global markets as well. So, um, you know, uh, it's just, a, it's a much tougher environment. And as I said, as far as pricing is concerned, um, it's it's more difficult, uh, um, and then of course we all know you know what we experience in South Africa in the office space. The same is is happening in you know offshore areas. So you know it's we we, we would expect going forward that there will be more flexibility for for employees. So they'll probably be working more from home going forward, um, and as a result of that, um, I think it will take years before the property market actually stabilizes at the levels we were pre-crisis. Thank you, Bern. Um, and actually connected to that, I just see a comment from Walter Mapam just asking, it looks like we're presenting from home and whether Melville Douglas staff are still working from home. Yes, that is the case. Although our offices are open, where necessary, some of our staff um, do come work from the office. But um, yeah, just to answer your question there, Walter, we are, we are still working from home. Um, the next question, Bern, is um, SA bonds yields are, are attractive, but what's your view on the capital risk of government bonds? I think I think the risk is is quite limited. I mean, I think um, you know, when we look at bonds in South Africa, I mean, there's a lot of bad news already priced in it. So, so the risk premium there is is well above uh, you know long term average. Now, one can argue it should be. Partly because our debt levels have increased significantly, but we also know that from a fiscal fiscal point of view, you know, our, our, you know, the, the revenue intake this year has been much much better than expected. Um, and so, when one looks at our uh, our debt metrics in South Africa, uh, they have improved by by much more than what was expected, I guess, a year ago and even um, earlier this year when the budget was presented. So, I think that is that is improved has improved. We still have long term concerns with regards to the growth in the economy, and we're still sitting with a lot of debt. And of course, we know that interest rates are still a very big component of government's expenditure. Um, having said that, I mean, I think, you know, from a capital risk point of view over the next year, I mean, clearly, clearly there is a risk that, you know, if, if global bond yields um, continue to move higher, and we've seen that happening this year, our bonds will probably follow that for a period of time. Uh, but, but we certainly expect our bond yields or, um, that they may very well increase from these levels, but not, maybe not at the same extent um, as we've seen previously, partly because, um, you know, you've got valuations on your side. And as I've indicated, um, you know, we're sitting with real yields of 5%. Uh, and my views, I think once things start to stabilize as far as interest rate outlooks are concerned globally, and remember the market has already adjusted to our inflation environment and our environment, uh, foreigners will start looking at our bonds. So, Look, there's always risk in the near term for, and there could be risk for our bonds in the near term. Uh, our view is just that if one sits back a little bit um, and take a slightly longer term view, if you can earn 10%, um, especially in a portfolio where, you, where you're not paying tax uh, and inflation is sitting at four, let's say 4%, and who knows, maybe in the future it could be close to 3%, that remains to be very attractive. So, so we would expect foreigners um, to start coming back to uh, our bonds, especially once we get into an environment where uh, there's more certainty about about the growth outlook, but I think in the near term, you know, um, as I've indicated, the world is going to a slow growth environment. When that happens, that tends to result in more volatility. Our trade balance in the country is expected to deteriorate, so we've had a benefit of much higher commodity prices. That's no longer the case, um, and so therefore, when that happens, it is possible that 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 assets such as the rand and and bonds in the near term could be under some pressure. Um, but look, that's you know that's very difficult to know whether that's going to play out over the next over the next year or so. 
Um, but uh, my advice for Messi would be to take a slightly longer term view. And uh, if you look at that from that perspective, um, we think they're very attractive. Thank you, Bern. And lastly, just to close off, just one question from my side. You mentioned that uh, increasing inflation is obviously a headwind. How do we protect ourselves against this? Is it a matter of you know, selecting stocks that um, have pricing power, or is it the fact, as you mentioned, we don't see inflation rising for that much longer going forward? Look, I think if you want to protect yourself against high inflation, it's, it's um, you know, <clears throat> it's important to invest into, into companies that have actually pricing power. So the market always will always differentiate between in companies that have pricing power and those that, those that don't have. So as far as equities are concerned, stick with the companies that have strong balance sheets. We don't have to worry about the impact of high interest rates um, on their cost of funding, as an example. So you want to you stay away from companies with, with, that are sitting with a lot of debt the, at this point in time. You want to stay away from companies that don't have pricing power. Um, and those companies will continue to be able to grow their profits quite nicely. So for some companies, in actual fact, or some sectors, high inflation is not a bad thing because it gives them an opportunity to price more for their goods. Um, so look, I think the, 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 the question about inflation is, is uh, you know, when does it become a real issue? So uh, again, if, if you know, our view is that inflation will trend lower going forward. Um, so South Africa, as I said, we don't have a big inflation issue. But, it, but if inflation expectations become, you know, let's say set at in the US at four or five percent, which is not the case currently, that becomes an issue in terms of the central banks will be forced to hike rates quite aggressively. And because what central banks don't want to lose is the credibility. And one, one of their main objectives or targets to meet, uh, or, or targets that they, that they um, or one of their mandates really is rather to ensure that there's price stability. So, um, so the central banks at the end of the day, irrespective of the growth environment, will react to, to inflation if it is, if it is, if it is, if it, is, if it persists basically. Um, on the other side, we also, we've also learned that over the last decade or, or even longer, that nobody wants to cause a recession. That's obviously a risk. So in other words, the risk is central banks high rates too aggressively and that results in slowdown and growth. When that happens, that's not good for, for risk assets. That's, that's, you know, during those periods, you actually want to own, ca own cash more than anything else. You don't want to own bonds, you don't want to own equities. Uh, but we don't think we're in that sort of environment at this stage. Thank you, Bern. And with that, we'll bring it to a close. Thank you for your time, Bern, and your presentation. To our audience, thank you for joining us this morning and indeed throughout the year in all our webinars. Um, we're going to put this to a close now. Thank you again for your continued support. Uh, good morning and have a good day, everyone. Thank you, Bo.